We are glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. And now, here's Charles Capps. Welcome to the Concepts of Faith broadcast where we're going to be talking about God's provision for healing. Now, you know, when you talk to people about the Bible, you get all kinds of opinions and views because people have been taught different. You have to understand, if, if you had been taught for years from a child that healing went out with the apostles and God doesn't heal anymore, or maybe he heals sometimes, but sometimes he makes you sick, then you'd believe that way because uh, the apostle Paul said, faith cometh by hearing. So, you know, whether you're hearing the truth or not, or whether you're hearing a lie, you'd believe it, you know, if you heard it long enough. So, uh, I want us to get into the scriptures today in the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. I want to show you the basis uh, for healing. It's in the atonement, in the price that Jesus paid. Healing is available. He made the provision available. And we need to understand one thing about uh, praying we ought to always go to God in prayer on the basis of the provision that's made, not on the basis of the need. You know, if there was, uh, if God just met needs uh, on the basis of a need, there'd be no needs. But God meets you on the basis of the provision that He made through His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Now, in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, uh, in fact, we're going back up to the 52nd chapter and read a couple of verses because, uh, three verses. It said, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And many were astonished at thee. His visage was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. Uh, now, this is talking about Jesus on the cross. Uh, he suffered sickness, disease, poverty. He suffered the curse of the law. You go to the book of Deuteronomy and you find that the curse of the law was threefold. It was poverty, it was sickness, and it was spiritual death. Jesus suffered those things for us that we wouldn't have to suffer those things. Now, you can suffer those things, but you don't have to. Now, notice as you come over into the 53rd chapter, he says, Who hath believed our report, or, or to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He goes on to talk about him growing up. Then it says in, in verse uh, 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Now this word, uh, surely, surely, in other words, it leaves no doubt that he bore, past tense, bore, our griefs, the, the Greek word translated griefs here, means sickness and disease. He bore our sickness and disease. He carried our sorrows. The word sorrows, the Greek word translated sorrows, means pain. He carried our pain. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, when he was put on the cross, uh, people thought that he was stricken and smitten of God and afflicted because of, of the wrong that he had done. But it was our wrong that he suffered. And he uh, says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now notice, that puts it in present tense. He bore our sickness, past tense, and it says, for, With his bruises, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. Ye are, we are healed. The word stripes and the word bruise are the very same word. Now, why they translated them different in the King James, I don't know. But in other words, the bruises or the wounds upon him was for our healing. So healing was in the atonement. It was all paid for on the cross. And you see, so many times people are praying for God to do something. You'll hear people say, Lord, just come down and touch me, would you, you know, heal me or so on. Well, the truth of the matter is that it was all done at Calvary. Now, if you understand that, we're not asking God to do something He's already done. It was done at Calvary. So the provision's already made. What we do is we make a demand on the provision that's made. 
And, and you'll find as you get into the Scriptures that that's what the Scripture teaches us. Now let's go back to the, the book of Numbers, because in the book of Numbers, you know the Old Testament is full of types and shadows. Now in the book of Numbers, we have a, a perfect type of Jesus, and, it, and it's a little confusing to some folks. It was for me for a long time because I wondered why in the world uh, you, you remember in the chapter 21 when Israel was in the wilderness, when they began to complain and, and got out of the will of God, snakes come up, came among them, fiery serpents. In fact, the Bible said the Lord sent fiery serpents among them and bit them, and they began to die. I mean, it was bad news. But what you need to understand that those fiery serpents were there in the wilderness all the time. They were not just there when they started complaining and, and got out of the will of God. They were there all the time, but they didn't bother them. They didn't bite them. But I'll tell you, when you go to complaining, the snakes come out, folks. And uh, let's, let's read it here. It says uh, in verse uh, 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Now, you see, here's a Mark 11, 23 of the Old Testament. You know, whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not his heart, believe what he saith, will come pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Here they said, you brought us out here, we're going to die in the wilderness. For there's no bread, and neither there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people died. Now ask yourself, if they would have been obedient to the Word of God, would they have been a bit, bit <laughs> Matt finished his tongue, would they have been bitten by the serpents? No, the serpents didn't bother them as long as they, they're minding their business, but when they go to complaining and, and, and telling God, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness, well, they got what they said, didn't they? I mean, the serpents came among them. Now, see, the King James says, the Lord sent fiery serpents among them. Now, folks, uh, you, you have to understand on the Old Covenant, the, the Jews, the Hebrew mind is this way, that if God allowed it, He committed it. So it's, it's written in a committed sense, like God did it. But uh, uh, Dr. Robert Strong, who was one of the foremost authorities on the uh, Hebrew and the Greek, says that many times in the Old Testament, it's translated in a causative sense when it was only in an allowing sense. In other words, God allowed it, but God didn't commit it. See, there's a difference in what God allows because God has to allow what you will allow. I mean, you get out here and, and uh, get over in sin, and the curses are going to come on you. The curses are out there. And uh, so they got out of the will of God, began to complain and say, God, you brought us out here, and we're going to die in the wilderness. And they did die in the wilderness. Probably thousands of them died. But it wasn't God that did it. The serpents were there all the time. Now, now notice something that after this, God said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. Now, I used to wonder, now why in the world did the Lord, why did you say from the, put a serpent on a pole? Why didn't you say put a lamb on that pole? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. Why not put a lamb on that pole? Well, you get over into the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God put the sins of the world upon his son Jesus so that he would redeem us and deliver us and bring healing to us. And he suffered it all on the cross. He made the total provision on the cross. The healing was in the atonement. It's all together in a package. Now, the word salvation, if you'll notice most of the time where the word salvation is used, it's an all-inclusive word. It means deliverance, preservation, healing, and soundness. In other words, total prosperity for the spirit, soul, and body. So here the Lord said, put a fire serpent, uh, make a fire serpent, and set it on a pole. It shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he shall look upon it shall live. Now, you know, that, that just used to confuse me. Why, we're going to look on a serpent, which is a type of Satan, and it's going to heal us? I couldn't understand that. 
But now let me give you another illustration. We'll not take time to turn to it. But when he sent Moses before Pharaoh, God said it, when he was teaching Moses to go, trying to convince him to go, and Moses had the rod in his hand, and he told Moses, said, throw the rod down. So he threw the rod down. It turned into a serpent, turned into a snake. And uh, then he told him to pick it up by the tail. When he picked it up, it turned back into the rod. Now here's a type in the Old Testament, a shadow, type and a shadow revealing that Jesus, which was the rod, the rod is a type of the Word of God, when it was thrown down, it turned into a serpent. In other words, it became sin. Now he did not sin, he became sin. That's what Paul says. He became sin for us that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he took on him uh, the sins of the world. So he became as a serpent so that he might redeem us. So this serpent on the pole is a brass serpent made it out of brass. Brass is symbolic of divine judgment, saying that divine judgment has rendered the old serpent Satan harmless and ineffective. Now, you know, if you had a brass snake, you can handle it, and it won't hurt anybody. It's not going to bite anybody because it's paralyzed. Well, thank God Jesus paralyzed the devil. Uh, it, when, when on the cross, he destroyed his ability to uh, kill mankind spiritually. The law was threefold. I, I mean, the curse was threefold. Poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. Jesus made all the provision on the cross, and here it is, uh, in the Old Testament, in a type and a shadow revealing that the serpent on the pole represented Jesus who became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. And not only that, it healed the people that would look and behold it. I'm telling you, if you'll behold what has happened to Jesus on your behalf to make a provision for the healing of your body, then when the serpent, the old Satan, has brought sickness on you, you will live and not die. Release your faith in the Word of God. Believe God. Act on it and see the miracle of God. I tell you, it's all in the atonement. I mean, it's good news, isn't it? Hallelujah. Well, I get excited about that. Now, we're talking about how God made provision for healing through Jesus Christ on the cross, and we see it in the Old Testament here where he lifted the serpent on the pole, and uh, everyone that looked and beheld that. In other words, if you realize that Jesus has paralyzed Satan. Now, now I think some of you think I make this stuff up. I want to turn to Hebrews because uh, uh, let's look in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2, and I want to read it to you out of the New Testament. Uh, verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2 says, For as much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. In other words, he came here as flesh and blood. Uh, that he through death might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, that he might destroy him. Now that, that word destroy in the King James is a little bit uh, misleading because that Greek word really means paralyze. So what Jesus did was he paralyzed the devil. He, he, he took away his ability to bring spiritual death. In other words, you, have, you don't have to die spiritually anymore because salvation has come. When Jesus came to the earth, salvation has come. He was the salvation of God. He, he, he had to come in a physical flesh, blood, and bone body, and to be suffered, tormented, and, and with bruises and stripes on his back for our healing. It was for our healing. He made deliverance available to us. So he paralyzed him that had the power of death, and that is the devil. So the serpent on the pole in the wilderness that delivered Israel from the serpent bites or healed them from that is a type of Jesus Christ who became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now I want us to go over into the New Testament, into the John's Gospel, the uh, ninth chapter. And let's look at a passage of Scripture that... Uh, has been very confusing to some folks, and, and you can read it one way and get one revelation, read it another way and get another revelation. Jesus passed by. He saw a man that was blind from his birth, 
And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, isn't that a strange question? Did this man sin or his parents sin to cause this fellow to be born blind? Well, you know, the Jews believed that a, that a child could sin in his mother's womb. So that's the reason they asked the question that way. Now, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents. Now, let's look at that answer first of all. You've got to analyze it or you get the wrong idea. Certainly this man has sinned and his parents because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he's saying that is not the reason the man was born blind. Now, can you understand what I'm saying? See, the intent of what Jesus said will give you the true revelation in this Scripture. He's not saying this man didn't sin, neither did his parents sin. He said neither the parents' sin or the man's sin is what caused him to be born blind, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, if you're not careful, you, you'll read this and say, this man was born blind so that the works of God could be manifest in him. Now, folks, if that is true, then you're accusing God of being a child abuser. Now, you wouldn't accuse God of being a child abuser, would you? I mean, if you could prove that someone here on earth did something deliberately to their child, caused that child to be blind or to be crippled so that God could heal him, they'll put you in jail. They'll put you away for life. That's child abuse. That's not our God or our Father. Now, see, there's a lot of people, some of you have been believing that all this time, that this man was born blind for the glory of God, and, and that may be the reason I'm sick. I'm, it's for the glory of God. You've been deceived by the enemy. No, God wants you well. Now, notice what happened, what Jesus said. But the, if he's saying, if the works of God are going to be manifest in this man, I must work the works of God. In other words, the man's going to be healed. But he said, neither has this man sinned, neither one of their uh, questions were true. Was it the man's sin or his sin? Now, he didn't say why the man was born blind. It might have been for various reasons. It could have been uh, uh, because of a, a problem at birth. You know, there's a curse out here, folks. There's not always a, a, a special reason for something like that, but you can know this, that sickness and sin itself came from Satan. There was none on the earth till Satan showed up here and brought sin into the earth, and then sickness and disease took over. As long as Israel walked under the covenant of God and obeyed the Word of God, there was no sickness and no disease among them. So this man's is, is blind. Now, watch what Jesus did. He said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and he made clay of the spittle. Now, he spit and made a mud ball and said, here's the mud in your eye. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the, you know, that shakes some folks up, wouldn't it? Put mud in the fellow's eye and it just make it worse. And he anointed his eye, the eyes of the blind man with clay, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. Now, I want you to notice something. Jesus took clay, spit, and made a mud ball and put in this fellow's eye. Now, uh, you know, there's always been the question, why did he do that? It's, it could possibly be because of the placebo effect. You know, they, they found out today that uh, if you believe they can give you a sugar pill or a pill that has a flower in it. And if it's the right color and you believe in it, it'll make you better. And see, all the drugs now that come out under the FDA has to be compared to a placebo because a placebo, if you believe in it, will cause you to be better. That proves that as you have believed, so shall it be. See, Jesus knew what he's talking about. Science is proving that Jesus knew what he's talking about. As you have believed, so shall it be unto you. So when you go to believing in sickness and disease, well, I guess I'm taking the flu. I always get it this time of year. You're going to get it. <laughs> I better get off of that. I'm meddling now. Now, notice, he, he sent him to the pool called Siloam. Now, he put mud in the fellow's eye, so he has to go do something. Now, 
this could be a placebo effect to cause the fellow to expect something to happen because nobody's ever done this before. It's very obvious. Nobody ever come up there and made a mud pie and put in the man's eye and made it worse. So he has to go wash in the pool. Jesus had to go wash in the pool. Now, the pool named Siloam, by interpretation, sent. Here's the revelation there. In Psalms 107, verse 20, it says, God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Now, this is talking about fools, folks. You go back and read the preceding verses talking about fools. God sent his word and healed them. So what about Christians? What about people that believe the word of God? Much, how much more would that healing be for us? He sent his word and healed them. Now, I want you to notice he said it and healed them. Didn't say he sent it to heal them. You know, if, if he sent it to heal them, might not work, but he sent it and healed them. That means that it worked. In other words, the provision was finished at Calvary. It worked. Jesus and God were the author of this provision for healing as far as God is concerned. Now, now, let me explain it to you because I know some of you think, well, yeah, but it didn't work for me. Here's the thing. As far as God's concerned, it's already an accomplished fact. We have to grasp that and understand that it's not something that God is going to do sometime. Some of you have been saying, I know God's going to heal me sometime. He healed you. As far as God's concerned, he did all he's going to do about it at the cross. When Jesus suffered and died, it brought healing. 1 Peter 2.24 for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, that's another scripture I, I crossed over to 2 Corinthians. Uh, he bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Were, past tense. When were ye healed? <laughs> ye were healed when Jesus died on the cross. In other words, God was saying the provision was made on the cross. The provision was in the atonement, and it worked as far as God is concerned. But did you know that there's nothing in the Bible, nothing in this New Testament that I know of that's going to happen to you just because it's in the Bible? You must b believe it, act on it, and receive it. In other words, you've got to believe in the atonement. You've got to release your faith in it. Jesus said, as you believe, so shall it be. Now, this man was sent to wash in the pool that was called sent. In other words, that pool, you know, in the Bible, Paul talks about the washing of the water of the Word. He's going to perfect the church uh, by the washing of the water of the Word, cleanse it by the washing, and present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It's through the Word. It cleanses us. So this pool name sent, reveals that is the Word of God, the water of the Word, and uh, when the man bathed in that pool or washed in that Word that was sent, in other words, he submerged himself in that which was sent, the Word of God, he came seeing. Now, I want to point out to you why you cannot say that this man was made blind for the glory of God, because the man, Jesus said, but the works, if the works of God are going to be manifest in him, I must work the works of God. Now, when Jesus worked the works of God, the man can see. He's not blind anymore. So what was the works of blindness? It was the work of the devil, or it, the root cause was that sin came into the earth and caused perversion of things. Could have been a num number of things that caused it, but the whole root cause of it is Satan is behind all sickness and disease. And when Jesus worked the works of God, the man could see. So the work of God was healing. The work of sickness and disease was of the evil one. I want you to know God's not sending sickness to perfect you. He sent His Word to perfect you. He sent His Word to bring healing. And He sent His Word and healed, and it worked. Thank God it did. He's done all He has to do. He's not going to do anymore. That's it. It's done. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. I tell you, I get excited about this. Now, we, we've talked about healing here, and I have a booklet here. I'm, we have an offer this week that uh, 
It's offer number 2124. 20, it's a uh, video called uh, Making a Demand on God's Provision for Healing, plus the God's Creative Power booklet, uh, God's Creative Power for Healing. Now, there's over a million of these books out. Uh, this booklet has a teaching on uh, the reasons why, the reason why that uh, words are important and what you believe and what you speak. And then it's a teaching on healing. And uh, let me just read some of the things in here. Uh, medical science aids healing through physical means by administering medicine into the physical body. God's divine healing is spiritual. It is administered through the human spirit. Psalm 107, verse 20, tells us that God sent His Word and healed them. And uh, so we, we go on with uh, a teaching on healing. Then we have confessions over here, scriptural confessions. Jesus is the Lord of my life. It starts out this way. Sickness and disease has no power over me. I'm forgiven and free from sin and guilt. I'm dead to sin, alive unto righteousness. I'm free from unforgiveness and strife. I forgive others as Christ has forgiven me, for the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. Jesus bore my sins in his body on the tree. Therefore, I'm dead to sin, alive unto God. By his stripes I'm healed and made whole. Jesus bore my sickness, carried my pain. Therefore, I give no place to sickness or pain, for God sent his word and healed me. Father, because of your word, I'm an overcome. I overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. You've given me abundant life. I receive that life through your word. It flows to every organ of my body, bringing healing and health. Now, what we're doing is speaking words aloud, voicing what God said about us, and it creates an image inside you of being well. Now, it won't happen overnight. I'm talking about this is something you do every day. I mean, just take it every day like you would take it. If you're taking medicine, you take it three times a day. Confess that till it creates the image on the inside of you of being healed and well and delivered. Now, in the back of this book, when we get through with the confessions, we have a, a, a chapter title called Understanding the Principle, where we teach on uh, uh, calling things that are not. That's what you're doing, calling for healing. So we have uh, audio tape and a video, and the book, God's Creative Power for Healing. It's offer $21.24 for the price of $20. Now, that's a bargain anywhere where you look at it, and I know some of you know some folks that need it. It's available to you. Have a toll-free order line. It's 1-877-396-9400. 1-877-396-9400. That's offer number 2124, making a demand on God's provision for healing. Uh, audio cassette a video, and the book, God's Creative Power for Healing, all for the price of $20. Until the next time, this is Charles Kapp reminding you the devil is a We are glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. To order the product offered on today's program, call 1-877-396-9400. For more information about Charles Capps Ministries or for a schedule of meetings, write to Charles Capps Ministries, P.O. Box 69, England, Arkansas.